Welcome to Dr. Levine's Practical Neuropsychology. Licensed clinical psychologist Dr. Levine brings viewers success stories by demonstrating how the brain works and neuroscience-based pragmatic ways to retain the brain to improve emotional regulation. So now, please welcome your host, Dr. Levine. Hello, this is Dr. Levine, and you're watching us on Bold Brave TV. This is Dr. Levine's Practical Neuropsychology. Welcome aboard. Today, I thought we'd do something a little bit different. Uh, so far, we've primarily co covered stress and anxiety, and uh, that's because I have a lot of therapy patients, and, and because of that, they have a lot of issues with stress and anxiety. And we all have stress and anxiety in our life, so we all can benefit, obviously, from learning from their experience. But today I thought what I'd cover is more uh, one of my executive coaching situations. I think we all can at some level find ourselves uh, uh, it, with most of our life doing pretty well. I think, you know, the uh, the metaphor of the spinning plates is appropriate. We're all have various areas in our life and at any one point, uh, probably three to five of them are doing well, but there's always that one that's teetering. You know, it might be our job or it might be at home or problem with a kid or uh, our weight. But <clears throat> we have some area in our life where it's stubbornly refusing uh, to uh, allow us to change it. So I thought today what we would do is we would go over a, a fairly typical example from my uh, executive coaching where I have uh, a number of successful folks come to me because they want to work on that one uh, spinning plate. So what I'm going to do here is kind of just share my, uh, my screen um, and give me... Uh, a moment here. And so <clears throat> typically what happens with uh, some of these guys is they'll plateau and they'll see themselves as a successful person. Um, And quite often they're um, upper middle class. They tend to be a little bit on the materialistic uh, side in the sense that, um, you know, they have a nice house, nice cars, and probably more, uh, more often than not, they, they're concerned about what other people think of their success and those kinds of things. Quite often they'll have a lack of, home life, work balance, you know, that kind of uh, uh, issue. And they'll talk a little bit about having some problems with their partner, a little bit about their day uh, being Groundhog Day. Uh, and they might be having some issues in their business. Quite often, they're pretty happy so long as things go their way. But if for some reason their business is giving them some grief and they get a lot of identity, out of that business, they'll uh, they'll be coming to me because the the most often plate that that'll be uh, wobbling will be the business. But I think a core issue is that they're not having fun, and quite often confused by nothing is wrong. So I, I don't think I think anyone who's a successful person can have some of these qualities or some of these things going on in their life and not quite understand what, what's going on. So back to my uh, conditioned without permission uh, slide, right? So what's happening with these folks? Well, from a bottom up uh, standpoint, their emotional regulation, they're usually pretty highly aroused and below panic at about 11, seven or eight of arousal is being driven. Quite often these folks 
are very driven. You know, they'll work long hours. They'll be highly competitive. Um, uh, you know, play in whatever sport they play, they'll need to be at the top. Uh, I think in the old days, we used to call them type A's. But I think what's important here is that they have very intense emotions, but unlike my anxious person who's, uh, doesn't like the worry, doesn't like the, uh, the avoidance, doesn't like some of the physical symptoms, these guys actually like being level eight. And it's really a pretty simple uh, reason for that is they're getting what they want, right? that hard driving, that competitive aggression, all those kinds of things are getting what they want. So there's very little difference between being driven by the by adrenaline, to, I got to get out of here, to being driven, I got to get this done because I want to, and that's at level eight. So one of the common characteristics is that People are very driven, high levels of arousal. Um, they're getting what they want. They don't actually consider it much of a, of a problem. And from a top-down perspective, they're usually pretty good at rationalizing that behavior as it's necessary to get whatever they want to get done. So when... Uh, uh, it's time to go home. I got to get this uh, last client done, or I got to get this one problem. I can't lose this best client, blah, blah, blah. They always have a good story as why they have to keep doing the behavior they're doing. So they've developed some pretty good uh, mechanisms uh, to support what it is that they really want to do. So how does a person who's actually successful and getting what they want for the most part and looks around and sees themselves as more successful than other folks, how does that kind of person go about uh, making the change? And basically, the, I, I consider, I think of the change process as a spiral, right? We're going to go through various levels uh, in our life with different situations where we're going to get some awareness there's an area in our life we want to change. The second thing is we have to set the intention. We have to be deliberate about wanting to make that change. And then lastly, we have to learn some new skills, make some changes in our life to actually make that change. And when we have that new change implemented, that new experience, It'll throw us into a new level of awareness, a new frame, and we'll probably want to continue to either work on that or some other area of our life. So basically, we got to look at how do we go through, how does this guy go through, or any of us go through, how do we gain first that awareness? I think one of the things is we have to look at what are the barriers that are keeping us from awareness? What are those things that um, are keeping us going? And I've talked earlier about how 95% of what we do is just automatic behaviors that we were conditioned to do. So in this case, uh, his, uh, the automatic behavior that this kind of person exhibits is if they just drive hard and work harder than everybody else, and spend more time at it and stay uh, focused at it, they'll get rewarded. And this becomes kind of in, uh, indoctrinated into their way of working. Now, what's interesting here is it can also become an obstacle for getting ahead because uh, if your success is dependent upon you driving extra hard, where this runs into a problem when people are running a company or whatever is it can run into some tension with their employees because their value systems will be a little different or it can be self-limiting that they can only get just so far with this one uh, hammer making everything else a nail. Now, 
egocentric is just a nice way of saying it feels right. It feels like it's the right thing to do to keep this pushing going. In other words, there's nothing in it that uh, would indicate to them there's anything wrong with it. Matter of fact, they'll very strongly defend it, why they have to behave the way they do, and they really believe it. Quite often, they're copying some model of others, either a parent or someone they've seen who's been successful. Uh, if they keep busy enough, they don't have to look at the consequences. They may be denial on some of the con consequences. Probably brighter than a lot, they can deflect quite often if you challenge them. They don't know a different way. Quite often these folks are self-made. They become hyper-focused on what they think the problem is. You know, the, in other words, if only I could grow my business, if only uh, this market opened up, if only uh, I could get the right staff in, I would be, in other words, they become very focused on either what the threat is or the um, solution. Again, this is an impact of that adrenaline and cortisol that when we are at high levels of uh, arousal from the adrenaline, we become hyper-focused on either the threat or the solution. In the case of these guys, instead of being ruminating and uh, getting lost in what they perceive the threat, quite often they'll become hyper-focused and hyper-aroused on what they perceive to be the solution. The problem is this gets in the way of, of uh, actually seeing some other opportunities. They'll selectively attend to evidence that supports what they want to do rather than looking at the whole picture. Like I said earlier, they tend to be intelligent and rationalization is usually creeping in. They can be depressive, uh, depressed, they can be defensive. Uh, sometimes they blame others. Uh, quite often when you try to say something they don't really listen. They know everything. I mean, I went into this quite a bit. In the first couple of sessions with most of these executives is them telling me why they know. <laughs> and then I, you know, eventually have to work with them to figure out and help them discover what it is that they, they don't know. Uh, they can be giving up and they can be irritable. All these things are some of the clues when you see, say, your spouse is is uh, exhibiting these things. These, is, these are kind of the byproducts of what happens when you're in that driven type of, uh, of mode that keeps you from being aware that the thing that you think is uh, saving you is actually causing your issues. So what I'd like to do is have you stand by and uh, right after this short break, we'll be getting into what are the behaviors or things that they can do to actually start becoming aware of what's going on. We'll see you shortly after this 30 second break. This is Dr. Levine with Practical Neuropsychology and looking forward to come back after the break. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy sense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals 
John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them. We discover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And welcome back to Dr. Levine's Practical Neuropsychology. I'm Dr. Levine. You're watching us on Bold Brave TV. Look forward to seeing you every Monday morning at 11. And uh, of course, you can catch these uh, episodes on YouTube. So where we left off with our friend was uh, he had a whole bunch of ways that he was avoiding uh, seeing that his being driven was actually the limiting factor in his life. And so... One of the things that, uh, in terms of action, ways of, of awareness that uh, the person has to do is they have to stop all those defensive behaviors. And probably the biggest one uh, that most people have to stop and they can catch the easiest is when they're uh, rationalizing or uh, justifying their, their, what they're doing. And anytime you justify a behavior, you pretty much, it's a dead on sign that, um, it's a dead on sign that you need uh, to look at whatever that behavior is. So some of the ways that we can become aware of things, first of all, we have to become open. We may have to ref reflect some acceptance. There's a whole bunch of things, but usually these types of uh uh, verbs, these types of behaviors aren't part of our day-to-day uh, -day, uh, activities. So one of the things that uh, we do in therapy, and I think this is one of our big roles, is helping with awareness. And in the, these guys' cases, usually um, what we end up having to do is work on uh, helping them with some psychoeducation to become aware of uh, how the the driving mechanisms work. Uh, we have to do usually uh, cognitive behavioral therapy or rational emotive behavior therapy where we have them look at what triggers their behavior, what the behavior is, and what those consequences are to help increase the level of awareness. Um, uh, other activities that we'll do is we'll help them measure uh, progress, maybe uh, do some kind of inventories, uh, encourage them to do some self-help readings, a whole bunch of different activities in, uh, in uh, we'll engage in to help them become more aware of uh, what's what's actually going on in their day. So then once they're aware, hey, I need to change, I need to do some things, maybe uh, get home at a more reasonable hour, um, get more exercise, take better care of myself, some of these life balance things, right? Um, they have to make a decision to do it. Uh, stop rationalizing, okay. Uh, there's a million reasons, but my health is as important or my family is as important. So I need to make that time. So making time means literally putting it on the calendar. I find that one of the clearest signs that people have set the intention that they plan on making a change is when they decide what's where, where is it going to fit into their calendar and what are they taking out of their calendar Maybe some acceptance is needed. Uh, you know, under, rarely does someone come 
uh, to, to a session with my coaching and they uh, genuinely just begin to accept that, yeah, this behavior that I thought was saving me uh, is, is working against me. So there's a process where uh, they have to go through uh, some emotional processing of uh, dealing with the loss, being annoyed or aggravated that this is true, the sadness and the acceptance. And they have to, we, we kind of work on finding some, something that motivates. Why would I want to spend more time at home? Why would I want to create a different balance? And quite often that may mean uh, understanding uh, what need that fulfilled and how to meet it in a more, in a different way. Again, commitment of resources, maybe they need to hire somebody, do some things. Uh, one of the uh, things I'm a strong believer in for intention is getting up in the morning and deliberately setting the intention for the day so that you can keep it in the forefront of your mind. And of course, need to be disciplined, uh, have discipline, actually follow through on that intention for action phases. So now part of that intention is to develop a mindset for a new experience. And this can be, um, be a challenge, right? Uh, one of the things is uh, a successful person quite often has some pretty well-honed mindsets. In other words, my uh, prototypical successful entrepreneur here, what will happen is he could be in a big battle with his wife on his way to work, but as soon as he gets in front of some customers, his whole demeanor, his whole mindset changes. He becomes uh, Mr. Professional Executive, right? He, his emotions change, his uh, thoughts change, his beliefs change, he lets go. So we have these different mindsets uh, that we're conditioned into. And one of the more fascinating things is that they're, they usually are situationally cued. So, um, you know, I have a certain mindset uh, for a sales presentation. I have a mindset for uh, when I'm uh, doing therapy, I'll have a mindset when I go fishing or a mindset when I go race a bicycle. So one of the things is uh, we have to consciously, if we want to experience new things, we have to look at these mindsets and understand when we're not in a mindset for a new experience or a new way of learning, a learning mindset. First is you're, you have to live in the truth. In other words, be willing to, um, to accept things for what they really are um, uh, rather than li living in some narrative or story we've been telling ourselves, uh, have to have some open-mindedness. Um, in other words, uh, tell yourself, I don't know. I'm, this is an experiment. I'm going to find out what happens if I do this. You have to have that willingness to try something new, um, which may include being tolerant of some uncomfortable feelings. And as the Buddhists say, have that beginner's mind where it's you're going to be lousy at it at first, right? I mean, you're a beginner at whatever your new behavior is and whatever your new experience is. You have to uh, expose yourself to the situations. If you're uncomfortable with public speaking, then you have to get out and public speak. If you're uncomfortable listening to emotions, you have to allow yourself to be exposed to listen to those emotions. Uh, have a mindset, the desire to learn new skills and a willing to practice. So at this point, what I'd like to, um, to, to share is that one, one of the things that people who come to therapy or even coaching quite often think is that somehow they got broken or something wasn't right in their past 
and they're going to come to therapy and they're going to talk it through and have a catharsis and then just move forward with more or less the notion of being prepared. But what really uh, changes about is understanding that we've been conditioned to respond to life in one way. We were conditioned without our permission and we practice it. I get people in like this guy might come in and, uh, you know, he'll understand that he was set up for this by his childhood. And then I'll say, yeah, I agree. But what happened at 18? Haven't you just reinforced this yourself? Haven't you lived the life of doing this? And I have yet to have anyone who really didn't pause in, on that, right? Because uh, at some point we have to take responsibility for the fact of no matter how we were conditioned as a kid, we haven't re-examined those basic premises. So part of this uh, whole process is to understand that what we're really doing is learning a new way of being, a new way of responding, a new uh, set of emotions and mindsets. And what it does is give us a choice. We certainly could drive in this guy's case, he still he can drive hard and work hard to get what he wants, but maybe he needs some other options. So maybe 80% of the time he'll still do that, that process. But now with learning some new ways of doing things, he'll have some other options. And with some mindfulness, he'll be able to choose between A and B, but we need to practice whatever this new skill is to have it as strong as the old one. So one of the ways of thinking about this mindset is I'm increasing my uh, repertoire of, th of options, my freedom to make choices. I'm not gonna always be trapped into the same uh, mindset. Uh, quite often with these guys, one of the things that'll bring them to, uh, to uh, coaching is that they don't like the way sometimes they treat their wife or their their husband, their significant other. And it turns out that when the significant other uh, is aggressive with them in any way, you know, pushes back or has demands of their own, it triggers an aggressive condition response. I mean, most of these guys have always gotten successful by being aggressive. They tend to, uh, dominate the competition, dominate their sport. So they find they don't really want to be aggressive back with their wife, even when she's being aggressive with them. So they have to develop a new mindset. How am I going to deal with someone being aggressive to me when their old mindset is always to be aggressive? So this is where we have to put a program together to help them uh, with that. And we're gonna, unfortunately, break uh, our little program up here uh, and we're gonna take another commercial break. And if you come back and when you come back after this break for Dr. Levine's Practical Neuropsychology, we'll talk about how we put a program together for uh, for you or for anyone who finds themselves in these uh, situations. So uh, we'll be right back after this short break. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. 
Be magical. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, hope, and support for caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. Welcome back to Dr. Levine's Practical Neuropsychology. You can reach me on drlevine.com. That's spelled out D-O-C-T-O-R-L-A-V-I-N-E.com. And you can catch the show here every Monday at 11 o'clock. So where we left off uh, our, uh, our program before the break, we were discussing how would we set up a, a program to actually uh, help uh, this uh, prototypical successful person with their emotional regulation. In this case, it's not anxiety, it's excessive drive and aggression. And how would we put in place a program for cognitive wellness? And a cognitive well wellness just means how am I going to spend more time being uh, happy, content, and uh, and uh, prosperous and in and, uh, uh, and giving uh, in, in a positive space rather than uh, you know struggling or surviving in life. So I usually address um, the spiral uh, uh, three iterations uh, with three phases with with my uh, my clients. The first phase usually people are coming because they have some specific uh, problems and they're causing them stress or distress. And so what we want to do is do two things. We want to uh, help with relief from that stress or distress, while at the same time increasing the functioning uh, in that area that's causing that distress uh, so that th they can actually function better. Um, and as we bring the emotionalism down, uh, regulate the emotions and, and help with that, they tend to function much better just not, without much more. The second level though is, uh, okay, so now I'm not being driven by my emotions to do stuff, but I still have a lot of demands and I wanna change my lifestyle uh, to one that's more comfortable, uh, has more flow to it, uh, maybe is a little bit healthier in terms of I might have some habits around food and exercise and and social engagements and even hobbies and just a little bit more balance. So how do I go about making those kinds of changes and support those and sustain those? And then the last phase is more uh, for most of, of the, the folks that, that hang in and say, more about uh, shifting into a, a spiritual uh, program of, of continuously working to be a, uh, a better human being and uh, of more service uh, to other people. So uh, in the case of uh, our friends, let's start at the bottom of the chart. Um, I'll start uh, typically uh, and the reason uh, each person gets their own program is that there's a lot of ways of creating awareness in therapy. There's a lot of things we can uh, do to help uh, based upon where there's a lack of awareness in the personality of the person we're working with. Some people, for example, um, 
respond really well to inventories. They love those little quizzes and those kinds of things, whereas others consider them gimmicky and would rather uh, 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 get into some functional analysis because they're very rational. So we have a lot of tools that we'll use for each, uh, each person as they come in uh, to, um, to help them with awareness. Um, uh, the intention is usually on them. It comes down to, uh, in the first phase, a lot of it comes down to uh, a conditioning, which requires practice, and then what the new experiences are. So for these guys, typically what I would do is I'd start there at the bottom. I'd have them understand their scale and have them reflect on their day um, and set the intention to reflect on their day and then apply the scale and and find uh, different situations uh, where they um, where they're uh, escalated or aroused, and where emotion may be blocking them from their change. <clears throat> so they just ref, uh, go through a period, uh, and they keep the scale going as they're going through. It's a way of also understanding how are you doing with the second item, which is emotional regulation. So to start with uh, emotional uh, regulation, I have folks uh, uh, condition some form of relaxation response. Progressive, relax progressive muscle relaxation is my go-to, uh, my favorite tool, but sometimes that doesn't work. Uh, I always uh, insist that if they don't do their daily practice, they send me a text, in which case I have a whole host of other tools for conditioning the centering response. And uh, quite often with these guys, I also look at, um, look at what they are doing in their, um, in their life uh, as far as ways to relax. Quite often it's exercise. I'll teach them that the three conditions to train the parasympathetic are oxygen to the brain. So you breathe a 20 minute break and then pleasant sensations. So if they're exercises, I have to teach them uh, breathe consciously with intent before you exercise, use the sensations of the exercise, don't solve problems. And one of the ways they steal the, the relax or the value of that exercise from a emotional regulation standpoint is if they're constantly pushing themselves or criticizing themselves, they don't get the third condition of pleasant sensations, have to teach them not to critique and to give themselves encouragement. And if they do those things, not only uh, do uh, doing the BMR or some other relaxation exercise, they're now going to also condition it with their exercise. So we work in how do they change some of their day-to-day -day activities to help them with emotional regulation. The next thing is um, understanding um, sensations. One of the things, almost to a T, everyone tries to use reason uh, to change an emotion. If they're, say they're really frustrated uh, with a client or with a situation, they don't understand that to bring your arousal down, uh, reasoning doesn't reach necessarily your midbrain. So I have them practice some visualizations and visualization is a great tool for motivation. Uh, so they also like it because uh, quite often we all have to motivate ourselves to go exercise or whatever. And the way to increase our uh, motivation uh, and also change from one emotion to the next is by going back and really remembering an experience where we had that emotion, where we had that, and then going through all our senses of sight, sound, smell, and somewhere along the line here, I'm sure if you keep watching our channel, we'll have uh, a whole session just on 
uh, how to do visualization. It's just a wonderful tool for managing emotions beyond the um, uh, beyond trying to use reason. And then the next thing is uh, we work on mindfulness so that they can catch themselves earlier in the cycle and stay focused on what they intend. So this is the first uh, uh, level of functioning and what we of the program and go, going through awareness intention and experience and as they're doing their practice uh they have the scale to measure their success are they uh catching themselves earlier are they spending less number of times uh, escalated or driven uh, are they getting some of the results they're looking for are they feeling better about what they're doing are others around them uh, enjoying working for it? There's all kinds of uh, things that you'll find that once you start regulating your emotions uh, and you're not being driven by them, then you're going to open up new kinds of opportunities and new experiences with other people. So this first level of uh, relief and function, the first uh, stage of our our plan with our prototypical driven guy is where he's going to learn or she's going to learn not to push so hard. And part of that experience is to learn what happens. And rarely does this take much more than two to four weeks before people start seeing uh, our guy will see pretty uh, positive results um, in, that, in that program. The second uh, area we go about in starting at the bottom is uh, learning about stress and how to appraise it. Uh, in other words, uh, there's a whole, uh, and a couple weeks ago, we covered about how we appraise stressful situations will, um, and how to manage those stressful situations uh, will help us do a better job of, um, of reducing the amount of stress we have in our life and the effect those demands have on us. And one of the ways that we uh, do that in therapy, and the way I would do that is help the individual inventory all the stressful activities in their week uh, and do a reappraisal and look at uh, resources and all the things to better manage those stresses and put a better uh, work-life balance uh, together. Now, <clears throat> quite often uh, we'll have uh, some cognitive biases some reoccurring thoughts, things that um, we're not even aware of that just have subconsciously crept into the way we think, which in turn supports our behavior or encourages it. And some of the ways that you can set intention is to do journaling is a big thing. Thought logs, come in and talk to your therapist. And what we encourage here is mindfulness and learning how to dismiss thoughts and how to replace them with more useful thoughts. And quite often I'll, for this kind of individual is pretty intelligent and isn't gonna be looking for my way of living life. I'll encourage them to actually study some philosophy. Learning can be fun and um, people forget this because they don't do it. And invariably my intelligent uh, clients just love uh, discussing some philosophy and changing some of the, their philosophy because this in turn, how we frame things and how we look at things uh, can totally uh, change the way we feel about adversity in our life. And quite often this is necessary because if you're a driven person used to the belief that with hard work you can solve any problem, when you run into problems with relationship, health, and death, you need some new tools. And this can cause quite a bit of stress. So here we help those successful folks out 
dealing with things in their life that they can't control and they can't change. One of the things that um, uh, it's important uh, for every positive emotion is a connection. So we, we teach about um, how to encounter and stay connected even when they're angry or uh, those kinds of things, practicing uh, being connected. And then uh, uh, lastly, we teach about uh, positive emotions and how to incur them and to observe them. So we're going to take one more short break and we'll be back to wrap up the third phase of today's uh, program for this individual. So we'll see you right back after this short break on Dr. Levine's Practical Neuropsychology. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy easysense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the Broderick Foundation Welcome back to Bold Brave TV here on uh, Dr. Levine's uh, Practical Neuropsychology. And we're just wrapping up today's uh, uh, program for our prototypical friend who's a successful executive, but looking to round out their life a little bit. So, so far, uh, what this individual had to do is go through a process of becoming aware of how their emotions were driving them, uh, either keeping them successful in what they wanted to do, but limiting them in other ways, learning how to manage those emotions, becoming much more functional, uh, and then looking at uh, their lifestyle and making some changes uh, to have a less demanding type of lifestyle and adding in some other uh, other things and developing new routines. The last phase, uh, which uh, is becoming a positive being, requires a significant amount of uh, retraining of the brain, and, and we use meditation for that. And uh, one of the things that uh, most people aren't aware of is that they have emotions like gratitude and uh, forgiveness and some of these other more positive emotions. It actually takes some training and some practice and guided meditations can help us with that. And also reflecting, developing a meditation practice and intention practice in the morning are important. So uh, most of the individuals who come uh, seeking that personal growth. We're looking for more balance, uh, benefit from uh, learning those new skills, uh, learning how to have emotional regulation, uh, uh, support during the process of changing their lifestyle, uh, even some of the emotional regulation stuff to help them 
change uh, and be motivated to make those changes. And then uh, ultimately, uh, every one of them uh, at some point ends up giving a lot more back and getting a lot more life satisfaction out of uh, out of uh, learning those new skills. And it's a it's a big transition going from um, going from that survival mode of creating your company and uh, uh, going through uh, the demands of being competitive and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I used to have to remind myself when I was an executive that even if you win the rat race, you're still a rat. So you need to uh, understand what is it that was really driving me. And one of the best uh, best stories of when I, when I interviewed for a uh, um, job as an executive uh, up for a company, I asked the president of the company, I said, uh, how do you keep this from all going to your head, being all ego or whatever in the position, doing it for the money? And he brought me over to the window and uh, we stood there and he, he pointed out to the parking lot and he says, see those 300 cars? And I said, yeah. He says, well, they that's 300 employees, 300 families. And I come to work every day understanding that I'm here to support them. I'm here to give them a, a living and a lifestyle. And whatever benefits I get from that uh, are a gift from, in his case, his God. And I thought it was a great lesson because, uh, you know, sometimes we lose the bigger picture. And if we get to the point where we're out of survival mode and we learn some of these skills, we can start living life. And part of living that life is giving back to our communities, to our families, to others, and it becomes just a natural way of being. So by working through uh, a program of, of uh, getting a better handle on our emotions, of really questioning our values, of developing some personal growth, we can make a shift from just surviving uh, and being to one of being and really living life. So you've, uh, thank you for joining us today on Dr. Levine's Practical Neuropsychology. Look forward to you again next week where we'll cover some specific ways of either doing the relaxation or increasing our awareness or gaining some new life skills. As you watch these programs, you'll see many different techniques to enhance your awareness, to help you set intention and to gain those skills to have a new life. Thanks once again for joining us on Dr. Levine's Practical Neuropsychology. This has been Dr. Levine's Practical Neuropsychology Show. Break old patterns and easily change negative habits with lessons that keep rewarding you for the rest of your life. Here Mondays at 1 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave TV Network.